the temple's Facebook. Uh, just give me a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I can begin now? Oh, I'm muted now. Hare Krishna. Good morning. Hare Krishna Gurudev. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Happy Ikadasi. Happy Christmas Day. Happy Gita Jayanti. Many things. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, just just um, a few seconds, Guru Maharaj, because um, it's going live on Facebook now. Yeah, we should we should start on time, not before time. Exactly. Still a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Can can you can you just check uh, if it's on on Gita Reading Society's page? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Guru Maharaj, um, we are already live right now. Mm -hmm. It's only 58 on my clock. What about you? Uh, yeah, it's only 58. That's right. Two more minutes. So we can hold on for a few minutes. Maybe you want to uh, sing Jai Radha Mother. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I could do that. Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Biha Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Jana Bala Bagirid Bharadhari Gopi Jana Bala Bagiri Bharadhari Gopi Jana Bala Bagiri Bharadhari Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare 
Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanjena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so it was on this day, which is, of course, e Ekadasi. For Tamil people, this is Vaikuntha Ekadasi, very important Ekadasi. Many people, South Indian people, they like to go to the temple on this day and spend the whole night there in the temple. And the understanding is, if you observe this Ekadasi, then you can go to Vaikuntha. Anyway, it was on this day, more than 5,000 years ago, Lord Krishna chose to speak the Bhagavad Gita at Kurukshetra. Lord Krishna se selected Kurukshetra, which is Dharmakshetra, a very holy place. Because Arjuna was gathered there with all his brothers and with his uh, relatives, and they were preparing for war. So Lord Krishna took this opportunity, he was given the opportunity to speak this Bhagavad Gita. But as pointed out in the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, this was not the first time Lord Krishna had spoken Bhagavad Gita. Rather the Bhagavad Gita is perennial knowledge, right, it's eternal knowledge. And Previously, the Lord has spoken it before. In the fourth chapter, Lord Krishna was describing the, his, the history of the Bhagavad Gita. Imam vivishvate yogam proktavam maham avyayam vivishvan manave prahur manur ikshvakave bravit. Lord Krishna is describing that previously I instructed this imperishable science of yoga to the sun god Vivishwan. And Vivishwan instructed it to Manu, the father of mankind, and Manu then gave the knowledge to Iksvaku. And in this way, the saintly kings understood it in course of time. So the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita was given initially or previously millions of years ago and it was given to Rajarshis, saintly kings. And the saintly kings would distribute that knowledge to all of their citizens. So in this way, the whole world was Krishna conscious because they were receiving the knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita through the disciplic succession. It's important for us to understand that there are many, many Bhagavad Gitas published in the market. And there are many people who may be devotees of Krishna, but they don't all connect to the disciplic succession. But Lord Krishna, he advocated the disciplic succession as being the proper means of transmitting the knowledge. 
and that was described also in the next verse of which I from the previous verse which I just quoted the second verse of the fourth chapter evam param praptam imam rajarshayo vidu sakaliniha mahata yoga nashta parantapa the, the knowledge was passed through the line of the cyclic succession and the saintly kings understood it in course of time but gradually the knowledge was lost yoga nashta parantapa the knowledge was lost what, what in what way it was lost it, the people deviated. Somehow they didn't keep the proper message. They maybe added something in or they took something out. And in this way, no potency anymore. So then the Lord understood. He had to re-establish again the disciplic succession. Very important. The knowledge has to be kept, kept very carefully. It has to be passed on without adulteration, without alteration. We have to keep it pure. That is why Srila Prabhupada chose the title for his Bhagavad Gita as, as it is. Because although there were so many other Bhagavad Gitas, they didn't present the knowledge as it is. They would present Bhagavad Gita as they think it should be or as they would like it to be. They would put their own political message into the Bhagavad Gita. And you have some people teaching that Bhagavad Gita is about non-violence, but it's spoken on a battlefield. And Krishna is encouraging Arjuna to fight. So there are many ways in which the message of the Bhagavad Gita was polluted. It has to be understood properly through the bona fide teachers who come in the line of the disciplic succession. And that is how Krishna established it. So we want to follow Krishna's message. It's not enough just to only speak about Krishna and do something else. We have to act according to the teachings of Krishna. If simply say one thing and do another, then it's useless. So when we speak the message of Krishna consciousness, it has to be supported by the proper actions, the proper behavior. Lord Krishna gave this knowledge to Arjuna because Arjuna was a devotee, hmm. described in Bhagavad Gita, Bhakto Sime Sakacheti Rehashyam Hieta Dutma. Because Arjuna was a devotee and a friend of Krishna. Therefore, he could properly understand this knowledge. Other, others, they may be Brahmana, that is not the qualification. It's very good if someone is a good Brahmana and he has the qualities of a Brahmana. Very nice. But he should go on and perfect these qualities by becoming a devotee, a Vaishnava. The Vaishnava is the perfect stage of the Brahmana. When he, come, when he actually becomes a devotee of Krishna. Once knowledge becomes perfect, when he surrenders to Krishna. We see in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes the process of knowledge, jnana yoga. Actually, that comes, particularly it comes in the, the last part of the Bhagavad Gita section. Bhagavad Gita is like in three sections. The first six chapters describing yoga of action, or karma yoga. Then chapters 7 to 12 describing bhakti yoga. And then 13 to 18, we have Gyan Yoga. So, Gyan Yoga, perfection of knowledge, is described in Bhagavad Gita. Bahunam Gyanmanamante Gyanavam Mam Prapadyante Vasudev Sarvamiti Samahatma Sadurlava. After many births and deaths, 
When one is actually in knowledge, then he surrenders to Vasudev Krishna. Such a soul is very rare. Some Mahatma, great soul, is very rare. But he, his knowledge has fructified. The perfection of the knowledge is to understand that Krishna, Vasudev, is everything. Everything is Krishna's energy. We have to understand there's a difference between Krishna and Krishna's energy. Impersonalists, Mayavadis, they will not distinguish between the Lord and his energies. They think everything is energy. And they think Krishna is also another form of the Brahman. When Krishna comes into this world, he thinks, so he's just like us. He's just the Brahman. He's just like us. He's a manifestation of the Brahman. And they think ultimately it's the Brahman which is supreme. But when we study the Bhagavad Gita, we learn that the Brahman is not supreme. Hmm. We learn that Krishna says, Krishna says in the 13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, I am the basis of the impersonal Brahman. Um, Krishna is described, the impersonalists, they think the Brahman is the basis of Krishna, but Krishna doesn't say that. Krishna says he is the basis of the Brahman. Brahmano hi pratishtaham amritasya vayashacha shashvatasya dharmasya sukhasyai kantikasyacha. Lord Krishna is describing how the Brahman is his energy. Shankaracharya, he had given importance to the aphorism that everything is Brahman. That everything is Brahman. But in Bhagavad Gita, we see that when Arjuna realizes Krishna's position, he, des he describes Lord Krishna as not simply being Brahman, but as being the Supreme Brahman. So there is Parabrahman. We are also Brahman. We are tiny sparks of the Brahman. But Arjuna, uh, Krishna, Arjuna describes Krishna as being the Supreme Brahman. This point is overlooked by the impersonalists, by the Mayavadis, by so many people. They do not recognize Krishna's actual position. Although Krishna has declared it himself in the seventh chapter, he says, Mata Paratara Mnanyat Kinchadasti Dananjaya Mai Sarvami Dham Prokram Sutri Mani Gana Eva. Krishna said, There is no truth superior to me. Everything rests on me, just like pearls are strung on a thread. So, this is unique, the fact that Lord Krishna declares himself to be the supreme truth. You won't find this kind of statement in any other scripture. No other deva ever claims that he's the supreme truth. You know, people argue, oh, Shiva's the supreme, oh, Ganesh is supreme, oh, Amma, and, and so many different gods are there. And sometimes people think they're all one, they're all the same. But from the Bhagavad Gita, if we accept the Bhagavad Gita, then Lord Krishna is describing his own position, that there is, there is no truth superior to me. It's a very bold statement. <laughs> but not only is Krishna saying this, but then we see in the 10th chapter how Arjuna also accepts this from Krishna. And, and Arjuna goes on to say, not only do I realize you, that you are the Supreme, but it's also been noted previously by people like Asita, Devala, Vyasa, Narada, so many great sages, great rishis, great yogis, they all recognize the supreme position of Lord Krishna. Therefore, this Bhagavad Gita is very, very important. Although Bhagavad Gita is not Shruti, 
<laughs> well, of course, th this is a di an interesting point because, you know, there are a class of people who only accept the Shruti. Shruti means the four Vedas, Rig, Sama, Yaja, Atarva, Veda. These, these, they will not accept other scriptures because they say, no, no, these are just coming from imperfect souls, this is just speculations, this is not truth. But they say, Vedas, this is Aparusheya, this is not coming from any ordinary person. These are divine words, this is eternal wisdom. But Bhagavad Gita, we could say Bhagavad Gita is also Shruti, because it's words spoken directly by Lord Krishna himself. Lord Krishna's words, his own words, Krishna Kata. Lord Krishna speaks this Bhagavad Gita. So this is the, the highest knowledge. Of course, it, Bhagavad Gita comes from the Mahabharata. And Mahabharata is compiled by Srila Vyasadeva. But Srila Vyasadeva, he has recorded the, Mahabha, the, the, the Bhagavad Gita within the Mahabharata. And the Bhagavad Gita is accepted all over the world as being perfect wisdom. No one can find any defect in the teachings and the explanation of the words of Bhagavad Gita. Everything which is spoken there is supported by evidence. The more we study the world, and we study the nature of life, everything is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna is speaking, first of all, he begins countering Arjuna's arguments. Because Arjuna has a dilemma, he has to fight the battle. And the battle is not a pleasant one. He has to fight against his relatives. So it's about decision making. You can see that making decisions, we all have to make decisions every day. We have to make so many decisions. So Arjuna had a very difficult decision to make. Should he take part in this battle against family members or not? So Lord Krishna, he's fortunate because he has Lord Krishna with him, and he took the opportunity to surrender to Krishna. Arjuna and Krishna have been friends practically their whole lives. They've known each other, they've grown up together, spent time together, they've spoken a lot together, discussed a lot of philosophy with each other. This coming together at Kurukshetra was not the first time where they discussed philosophy. They would regularly meet and discuss philosophy. And so Arjuna took the opportunity to surrender himself to Lord Krishna and ask Lord Krishna to guide him. We could think, well, maybe he accepts Krishna's guidance because he knows Krishna's impartial. He doesn't have the same feelings towards people. It's difficult for Arjuna to make the decision because he has, his, he has to think about people who he has personal relationships with. First of all, the sons of Dhritarashtra, who were always creating tension with the Pandavas. But then he has also his dear grandfather Bhishma and his beloved teacher Drona. So it's a very difficult decision to, for Arjuna to make. But he takes the opportunity to surrender himself to Krishna. That's a very important decision to make. We want to make decisions. We should want to be guided by the highest authority. And the highest authority, Lord Sri Krishna. We could say, well, Arjuna was fortunate. He had Lord Krishna personally present. We are also fortunate because we have Lord Krishna's words. The words which Lord Krishna spoke to Arjuna, they are with us today in the form of the Bhagavad Gita. 
we have to learn to take shelter of the words of the Bhagavad Gita. And when we make decisions, we want to be guided on the basis of scriptures. And the most important of all scriptures, the one which is known by people everywhere, is Bhagavad Gita. This is the very, very fundamental essence of the Vedas in the Bhagavad Gita, given to us by Srila Vyasadeva. And he's given not his own words, but the words of Lord Krishna. He's transmitting. So this is the parampara. You can see Srila Vyasadeva being a perfect acharya. He's transmitting the words of the acharya for us. He himself is the acharya and he heard these words and he's passing them on. So Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna takes up Arjuna's challenge. What should he do? Should he fight? Arjuna gave so many reasons why he didn't want to fight. So Krishna, as the expert mentor, he guides his disciple Arjuna and he defeats all of Arjuna's different arguments. The first six chapters we have the yoga ladder. But even before the yoga ladder, Krishna is countering Arjuna's reasons for not fighting. When he talks about the eternal soul, Krishna is defeating Arjuna's argument for not fighting on the basis of compassion. And when Krishna speaks about karma yoga, then Krishna is defeating Arjuna's argument that he doesn't want to fight because he's worried about sinful reactions. Because one who engages in karma yoga doesn't suffer any reactions. If he's properly engaged in karma yoga, there are no reactions. So Krishna is guiding Arjuna. He counters the different reasons why he doesn't want to fight. Krishna shows the, the mistakes, the, the, the wrong in the thinking of Arjuna. And he encourages Arjuna in the path of yoga. And yoga is not inaction. That's one important message of the Bhagavad Gita. Sometimes people often think yoga means to stop work to give up work, to sit down and be idle, but rather it's just the opposite. And we could see that's maybe why Krishna chose the battlefield of Kurukshetra to speak this Bhagavad Gita, because he's encouraging everyone in action, but actions which are properly motivated. The motivation shouldn't be simply for our own gain or for our own profit and distinction, but rather action, one should learn to act for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. That is actually karma yoga. When you give the fruit of the work for the pleasure of the Supreme. Bhagavad Gita, karma yoga is described this well-known verse, karmani eva dikaraste, Lord Krishna is telling Arjuna, you have a right to perform your duty, but you're not entitled to the fruit of your work. Never be attached to not doing your duty and never consider yourself to be the cause of the results of action. So in this way, Krishna is guiding Arjuna. By guiding Arjuna, he's guiding all of us. What should be our mood in working, in action? We should not be attached to the fruit. Of course, that's very difficult. We're all concerned about the results. We want the good result. We want to enjoy the fruit. But... Krishna is saying, actually, that fruit, that's mine, that belongs to me. We have to learn to connect to Krishna. Yoga is all about connecting to Krishna. 
So connection begins by action. We want to act on behalf of Krishna. And Krishna encourages Arjuna, work, but work for me. Give the fruit of the results to me. Karma Yoga is therefore encouraged by Krishna. But Karma Yoga is not the culmination of the yoga, yoga ladder. And we see in the, yoga, in the first six chapters how Krishna brings the process of yoga step by step to higher levels. After describing Karma Yoga, then Krishna comes into, brings in Buddhi Yoga, or Jnana Yoga, how we can cultivate knowledge and at the same time also act. Being a Jnana Yogi is, doesn't necessarily mean that one has to be inactive. One can also work with proper knowledge. So then, one, when one has proper knowledge, one may also want to go into the uh, Astanga Yoga, which gives a lot of emphasis on meditation, Dhyana Yoga. And that's also mentioned in Bhagavad Gita in six, sixth chapter, practicing yoga by meditating, controlling the mind. And Arjuna, when he hears Krishna describe this, and Arjuna said, wow, I can't do that. I'm not able to just sit and control my mind and not do anything. Krishna, Krishna tells Arjuna, yeah, I know it's difficult, but it's possible if you practice. You have to practice and you have to be detached. And if one does Astanga Yoga, then Astanga Yoga will lead one to the culmination of the yoga ladder, which is the path of devotion, bhakti yoga. So bhakti yoga is simply working and remembering Krishna at every moment, doing everything for his pleasure. And that bhakti yoga process is then described in the middle section of the Bhagavad Gita, chapters 7 to 12. Prabhupada describes, he said, just like you have a, a sandwich. So sandwich, you know, you have bread on the outside and you have the good thing in the middle. And so Bhagavad Gita is like that. Some people think, oh, because jnana comes at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, so the process of yoga, the culmination of yoga is jnana. But actually, it's not. It's like the sandwich, and the good thing is not at the end, the good thing is in the middle. The process of bhakti is de described then. In this middle portion, the ninth chapter, we have the most confidential knowledge. And that is summarized for us in the final verse of the ninth chapter, where Krishna describes what is the most confidential knowledge. Manmana bhava mad bhakto madhyaji mam namaskaru. Mami vaishya si yuk vaivam atmanam mad parayana. Krishna says, engage your mind in thinking of me, become my devotee, offer obeisances to me and worship me. Four activities, all relating to the process of devotion. And four not difficult activities, very basic activities. But we have to think of Krishna. To think of Krishna, you should know something about Krishna. We have to know who is Krishna, what does he look like, what's his form, what does he do, what are his activities, what does he say, what are his qualities. We can understand all this from the Bhagavad Gita. We get information, we get descriptions. Krishna is revealing himself to all of us through the words of Bhagavad Gita. So think of Krishna, become Krishna's devotee, just like Arjuna is a devotee. One who is a devotee of Krishna, then one will also serve Krishna. We will want to, we will want to show our devotion to Krishna through our actions, by our devotion, 
by chanting his name and by also preaching and teaching his message, taking up the mission of Krishna. The mission of Krishna, that's also described in seventh chapter, Bhagavad Gita. Krishna describes it. Uh, oh no, no, fourth chapter, fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Krishna describes his mission, how he comes to establish religious principles so that we can help Krishna in his mission by preaching the message of Bhagavad Gita, by speaking about Krishna. Very important. We want to devote ourselves to Krishna. Devotion means practical activities for the pleasure of Krishna. And how to please Krishna? By bringing others into consciousness of Krishna, letting other people know about the message of Krishna. This is bhakti yoga. Of course, bhakti yoga begins with hearing. So the seventh chapter also, Lord Krishna explains in the very first verse of the seventh chapter, he says to Arjuna, now hear from me, Arjuna, how by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me, you can know me in full, free from doubt. So hearing from Krishna, very important. This is why we read Bhagavad Gita. Today on this day, the what we sometimes call Gita Jayanti, the actual day in which Lord Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita, it is customary many devotees will read the whole Bhagavad Gita. They will chant the, all the 18 chapters of Bhagavad Gita. I know many devotees who are planning to do that today. We will also be doing it here in Mayapur. It's customary everywhere. Go through the Bhagavad Gita, chant the Slokas doesn't take very long, about two and a half hours, three hours. You can recite the whole Bhagavad Gita. Srila Prabhupada actually instructed devotees that every day we should chant one chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. We should recite one chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And if we do that, one chapter a day, then in 18 days you finish the whole Bhagavad Gita. And then you finish it, then you begin again and you read it again, one chapter at a time. And after you've done this several times, then we start to remember the Bhagavad Gita. We start to remember what did Krishna say? What was Arjuna's question? What did Sanjay say? What's Sanjay's involvement there in the Bhagavad Gita? We will get to know all of these things the more we read the Bhagavad Gita. Very important for us to study this Bhagavad Gita because this is our foundation in the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. So we said chapter 7 through chapter 12, Lord Krishna is speaking about Bhakti Yoga and then we come to the final section, chapter 13 up to 17, Lord Krishna is speaking more about jnana. He's giving the knowledge to understand this, how we can understand the Supreme Lord. Lord Krishna particularly will describe about the modes of nature and how the modes of nature act and how they affect everyone. Very practical information. From the Bhagavad Gita, we can understand how much we are influenced by the different modes, goodness, passion and ignorance. And we can also, from Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna explains that to get free of the modes of nature, we have to engage in bhakti yoga, devotional service, that is discussed here. Arjuna wanted to know how to overcome the influence of the material nature and Lord Krishna described mam chayo vaya bicharena bhakti yogena sevati sagunam samati chaikam brahma bhuyaya kaupati anyone who engages in my devotional service Lord Krishna said 
then they immediately transcend the modes of nature and they come to the level of Brahman. The level of Brahman, the transcendental platform. So this is important teaching people about the influence and the effects of the modes of nature, how much we are all influenced by this material energy. Although we are living with the material energy and it's controlling us and influencing us every day, most people are not aware of it. They never heard. They didn't know. Even Hindu people, They've heard of Rajagun and Tamagun, but they don't know how it works. They don't know how it binds, and they don't know how to get free from these effects. But it's all there in the Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna is telling us how we can get free. We just simply have to surrender to Krishna. Of course, surrender to Krishna, that comes up. In, I was saying that the 17th chapter is actually the conclusion of the Bhagavad Gita, but the 18th chapter is Krishna's summary of everything he's taught. Right? The first, uh, the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita was also something of a summary of what he was going to teach. You can understand from the title which Prabhupada gave to the second chapter, Contents of the Gita Summarized. But it's in this 18th chapter where Lord Krishna actually really summarizes everything he taught. And he takes us through the different teachings from coming to the level of Brahman and then going on to realize Paramatma and then coming to the Bhagavan level. And Lord Krishna, of course, he is Bhagavan. And we can know him by devotional service. And Lord Krishna explains the glory of devotional service, that he can only be understood by devotional service. Other processes will be always incomplete. So becoming Krishna's devotee means taking up these activities of devotional service. Surrendering ourselves to Krishna and surrendering, surrendering ourselves to Krishna's service. That is the famous verse in the Bhagavad Gita which comes at the end of the 18th chapter where Krishna is concluding his teachings and he says to Arjuna, just give up all forms of religion. Sarva dharmam parigyashnam mamikam sharanam braja. Now this verse sometimes puzzles people that Lord Krishna came to establish dharma, but he's telling Arjuna to give up all dharma and surrender to him. We have to understand these things properly. Krishna came to establish what is actually religion. And when he tells Arjuna, to give up all dharma, he tells Arjuna to give up all dharma which are materially motivated. Those re religious principles which are based on the body and his own uh, material situation, those kind of principles of religion, they should be given up. That is called kaitava dharma, that is like the cheating religion, it is not actual real religion. Lord Krishna came to establish real religion, religion which is centered on the soul, the need of the soul to awaken our God consciousness. So by studying the Bhagavad Gita, we can come to this conclusion that Lord Krishna is the Supreme Lord and that we are all his tiny parts and parcels. We have an, an eternal relationship with him and we can cultivate this relationship through understanding the message of the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita, the song of God. Krishna is singing, he's teaching by song. These words of the Bhagavad Gita, they give so much solace 
to all the devotees by remembering how Lord Krishna kindly came to speak this knowledge for all of our benefit in this dark age of Kali Yuga. We know the Kali Yuga is not a very good time. It is not a very auspicious period in the history of the world. There are much better ages. Such a yuga, people are all God conscious and very pious, like Paramahamsas. Gradually, however, deteriorates to from such a yuga to Treta yuga to Dwapara yuga, and now Kali yuga, where religion is practically a myth. People have forgotten what is the real goal of life. They're so absorbed in the body. Although Lord Krishna has spoken very clearly in the Bhagavad Gita that we're not the body, still everybody, we're still so attached, we're so much in ignorance. How we can get rid of that ignorance? To get rid of that ignorance simply requires surrender. We have to submit ourselves fully to Krishna. Surrendering to Krishna begins by hearing from Krishna, by hearing his teachings. And we hear directly the words of Krishna in the pages of Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita has 700 slokas, 18 chapters, 700 slokas. If you read a chapter a day, 18 days. If you read a sloka a day, then it will take you only two years you can complete the whole Bhagavad Gita. But of course, you can read more than one sloka a day. You don't need two years to finish the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita has to be studied repeatedly, however. We have to hear it again and again. Because we are conditioned souls, we're very much covered by ignorance. And just simply hearing one time is generally not sufficient. Rather, we have to hear it again and again. But the more we chant, just like the holy name of Krishna, the holy name of Krishna has great spiritual potency. But because of our ignorance, we're not able to taste the nectar of the holy name. But if we go on chanting the holy name of Krishna, gradually we awaken a taste. And the same is true with the Bhagavad Gita. If we again and again regularly make a habit to read the Bhagavad Gita and to consider the contents of the Bhagavad Gita, then gradually we will awaken more and more taste for this message, the nectarian teachings of Bhagavad Gita. In the Gita Mahatmya, it is nicely described how uh, this Bhagavad Gita is like Ganga water, it's like the Ganges. Just as the Ganges purifies, so the Bhagavad Gita also purifies. Now the Ganges, that's connected with the lotus feet of the Lord. We know Lord Vamanadev made a hole in the universe and from his stepping, when he took three steps of land, with one of the steps he pierced the covering of the universe. And at that time, the water from the Kajol Ocean came in and came through the universe in the form of the Ganges. So that water had washed the lotus feet of Lord Vamanadev. So very purifying. But the words of Bhagavad Gita are even more purifying because they come directly from the mouth of Lord Krishna. And another verse of the Gita Mahatmya is nicely described. Sarva Panishado Gavo, Dokta Gopalanandana. It's describing that the, this uh, Bhagavad Gita is like a cow. And Arjuna, Lord, Lord Krishna is the cowherd boy. 
who is going to milk the cow. And Arjuna has come in the form of the calf to get the cow. For the cow to give her milk, the calf comes, Arjuna comes, and with Arjuna the milk of Bhagavad Gita is flowing. And thoughtful men and great sages and yogis, they will all drink that nectarian milk of Bhagavad Gita and become purified. It's the Bhagavad Gita, it's none different from Lord Krishna. So we want to encourage people, particularly on this day, how much important it is that you should read Bhagavad Gita regularly, make it a habit. Not only just today, but every day you want to remember Bhagavad Gita, recite verses from Bhagavad Gita. We often quote verses from Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada says, he said, just like in a law court, when the lawyer's in the court, he will quote that, oh, a previous case, this judge said like this, and the evidence was given, and the judge accepted this evidence. They will give evidence to support their case. So in the same way, when we present the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, the, the, the teachings of the Krishna conscious philosophy, rather, then at that time we will also quote Bhagavad Gita. And nobody can argue. Nobody can say, oh, no, no, I, well, only a rascal will say like that anyway, if they don't accept Bhagavad Gita. We did say there are, there are a class of people who don't accept the Shruti. And Bhagavad Gita is considered Shruti because it's taken from Mahabharat, which is Shruti. But, or rather, Bhagavad Gita is Smriti, right? The Shruti is the four Vedas. So Bhagavad Gita is not Shruti, it's Smriti. Shruti is the hearing process, Smriti is remembering. So Bhagavad Gita is from Mahabharata, Smriti, and class of people, Vedantists and so on, they won't accept. They only want to hear from the, the Shruti, give evidence from the Shruti. <laughs> so, we say anyway, the words of Lord Krishna, that is Shruti. That is directly from the mouth of God. The Supreme Lord is speaking to us in the form. And in the form, as, as Lord Krishna, he comes to this world just to establish Dharma by speaking this Bhagavad Gita. So very important for us all to hear this Bhagavad Gita and hear and, and once we have understood it ourselves, we should also pass on this knowledge to others. We want to share whatever we have had. Whatever we have learned, whatever we have understood, we want to pass it on to others. Uh, Prabhupada quotes, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used to say, one who is born in India should make his life perfect and then he should distribute the knowledge what, to others. Bharata bhumi tehai manusha janma jar janma sartaka kare kara para upaka. So make yourself perfect first. How to become perfect? Simply from this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita. You read the Bhagavad Gita every day and you can become perfect. Just like people go to get health, they bathe every day in the Ganga and become healthy. If we bathe every day in the message of the Bhagavad Gita, we will become fully healthy spiritually. We will awaken our full consciousness of Lord Krishna. And consciousness of Krishna means also consciousness of everything in relation to Krishna. And what is not in relation to Krishna? Everything is Krishna's energy. Everything has its connection to Krishna. Right? Lord Krishna describes his different energies in Bhagavad Gita, 7th chapter. Bhumera pona lo vayo kamano budere vacha ahankarai tiyame bina prakriter ashtada. Krishna describes that 
these elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence and ego, altogether these eight comprise my separated material energy. Right? It's prakriti, Krishna's prakriti, his nature. You and I have a nature, Krishna also has his nature. His nature is there in the form of the elements of this material world. But then we learn there's another prakriti also. Apariyamitas dvanyam prakritim vidime param jiva bhuta mahabaho yayidam jadaryate jagat. That beside these elements there's another energy of mine, Arjuna, which are all living entities who are trying to exploit the resources of the material world. So we are we are that prakriti. We are also Krishna's prakriti. Right? We, we are superior prakriti. We have consciousness. So we have superiority over dull matter. But we are also prakriti. We are Krishna's energy. And we have an eternal relationship with him. So we see... Uh, very nicely explained in the Bhagavad Gita, the importance of distributing this knowledge. And Krishna says, one who will teach this knowledge to others, then he's the most dear person to Lord Krishna. Krishna says, Nachatasman Manushyeshu Kishyanme Priya Kritama. There's no one more dear to me than that person who is t teaching this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita to others. So we, you want to become dear to Krishna, you have to take up this message of Bhagavad Gita and you have to teach it to others. First of all, make yourself perfect, learn it, and then pass it on to others also. And there's a great need for preachers of the Bhagavad Gita all over the world. There's a need, people need to hear, because there's no educational institutes to give this knowledge. It's sadly lacking in the world today. It's our duty to try to distribute this knowledge, not to be miserly, just keep it for ourselves, but whatever we know, pass it on to others. Hmm? And the, the result the benefit of all this is described in the final verse of Bhagavad Gita. Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yatra Partur Danur Dara Tatra Sri Vijayo Bhutir Dravanitir Matirmana. Sanjaya is saying, wherever there is Krishna, the master of all yoga, and Arjuna, the expert bowman, there will be victory morality, extraordinary power, and opulence. Sanjay said, this is my opinion. So Sanjay's opinion, wherever there is Krishna and Arjuna, so much, and how, how can we invoke the presence of Krishna and Arjuna? Simply through this message of Bhagavad Gita. This is how we can have the presence of Krishna and Arjuna simply by keeping up this message of Bhagavad Gita, passing it on more and more to more and more souls. So four things are there. Victory, morality, extraordinary power and opulence. I'm sure we'd all love to have these things, these four things, very important, very attractive. How we can get them? Simply by taking shelter of Krishna, Lord Krishna, and Arjuna through their teachings in the Bhagavad Gita. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. The, the lecture um, elicited the teachings of Lord Krishna and gave a wonderful summary of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, two announcements at this juncture. The YouTube link will stop momentarily, uh, very shortly, for I will move into the Goranga Center for the recitation of uh, all the 18 chapters of Bhagavad Gita. Um, but the Zoom link will, however, continue for questions for Guru Maharaj. So I'm going to stop the, the, the Facebook link right now.
Okay, it stopped. Um, I did not see anyone chatting in any questions. So if you have a question, kindly unmute yourself and uh, speak up. Please. please introduce yourself and switch on your camera if you want to go. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, this is Dwar Krish. Can you hear me? Yes, Prabhu, can hear you very well. Yeah, Guru Maharaj, my humble obeisance, Guru Maharaj. I hope Guru Maharaj is well and fine. My question here why the learned uh, uh, sages do not consider Bhagavad Gita as a Sruti, despite it's directly spoken by Lord Krishna, whereas the Veda, the four Vedas, they consider Sruti. But actually the Vedas are spoken by Krishna to Brahma, from there it comes down. And all these scriptures are written by Vyasadeva. So what is the logic behind them, Don't, not considering uh, Bhagavad Gita as a Sruti? Well, we have to understand generally these people are not devotees. They don't accept Krishna as being the Supreme Lord. They may accept Vishnu. And, you know, they may accept Vishnu as the Supreme, or they may simply be impersonalists. There are many Vedantists, they are impersonalists. And so they have many verses, many statements from the Vedas to support their philosophy. They don't see the importance of Lord Krishna. They don't recognize Krishna in that supreme way. And whatever verses we quote, they have their verses to quote. <laughs> you know, we give our verses, but they have their verses. They've got also other evidence. They will say, no, no, but other places it says like this, you know. It's always a difficult thing, just like you go in a court, you know, one lawyer says one thing and the other lawyer, he says something else. And then the judge has to make a decision. You can read, for example, in the Science of Self-Realization, Srila Prabhupada had some correspondence with one professor at the University of California in Berkeley. The devotees were trying to begin a Krishna Yoga Club at the University of Berkeley, and so there was one professor from the Asian Studies, and he had some correspondence with Prabhupada, and he, this professor, he was like a Vedantist, you see. So Prabhupada would say one thing and he would say something else. And so we'd go back and forth. And Prabhupada said, yes, it's, this is the nature. And he said, there are different, different viewpoints we have to understand. So Thank you, Guru Maharaj. I cannot convince everyone about the supreme position of Lord Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna please, Prabhu. Please accept my questions. Uh, just to uh, ask something uh, about why do people. Can you bring your uh, head up, please? Your phone is. You're, you're covering your face. We can't see you. Uh -oh. Is it all right? Yeah, uh, Maharaj, because uh, uh, I just want to ask why do people. After hearing such message, uh, they still stay in the uh, darkness of ignorance, still maintain their own philosophy and the breakthrough is uh, this, uh, is, uh, what is a uh, message of salvation from the Godhead and still maintain the material uh, uh, attachment. Yes, material attachment is a very <laughs> powerful, material energy is very powerful and we get very attached to it. So although people may hear the message of Bhagavad Gita, doesn't mean that they'll immediately become detached from it. It's going to take some time for people to get really free from the attachment. You know, just like you take medicine, you don't just take medicine one time and get cured. Of course, now they're trying, you know, they want to give everyone some vaccine, they think give everybody the vaccine, they'll cure every, protect everyone from COVID. But it's not so easy thing. You know, how long will the vaccine last? Is the effects going to last 
Will it last forever? Or will you have to get an, a shot every year or what? And so the knowledge like that, knowledge of Krishna, hearing about Krishna, for some, someone they may be fortunate, they may hear immediately and they may take it very seriously and they completely change. But other people they may hear again and again and again and, and they don't change. So as you say, the problem is attachment, material attachment. How to get free of that attachment? The mercy of the devotees can be there. The devotee, the, the pure devotees can give great mercy, but still they don't, they don't want the mercy. They don't take advantage of the mercy of the devotee. So this is a problem. Who wants to drink the mercy? Who wants to take the mercy? of the devotee. They hear, they contact the devotees, there's benefit for them, but we don't know how long it will take before it will take effect. But there's no loss. Devotee is always compassionate, he's always willing to speak and try to help, try to deliver the conditioned souls from their ignorance, from their attachment. Is it also the due to karma? Uh, it's difficult to get access to the understanding of Bhagavad uh, Gita. Well, karma is not it. What what we usually say is what what you say is not just ordinary karma, but they need to do some really special pious activities. You right? We get them to. To, to do some agyata sukriti. We get them to do some devotional service for, or do some service for a devotee or for the Krishna consciousness movement and that qualifies them to hear more. If they will do some service for the devotee, that's the best thing which can help. If they can serve the Krishna consciousness movement if they donate some money, their hard-earned money for the service of Krishna consciousness movement, it's very purifying, very beneficial for them. If they just come and sweep the floor, they do something to help the devotees, it's very beneficial for them. And that can help them to hear better and to get freed from their attachment. But they have to want to get free. They have to want to get out of that maya, out of that ignorance. Not everyone wants. Uh, people are, people say, oh, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm okay. <laughs> they don't realize how much they're suffering. This is a problem. People are in ignorance and they don't even see the difficulties. They don't see the problems of the material world. They're thinking, no, it's okay, I'm all right. <laughs> and you try to warn them about the danger. They don't see. So what can be done? Anyway, we keep trying, we do everything we can to try to give mercy, try to bring them closer to Krishna consciousness. Yes, Maharaj, thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj? Yes, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please ask my own business. My business. Mr. Sri Prabhupada. Uh, Maharaj, do you mind if I make a comment to, to Agadish Prabhu's uh, question? Yeah, please. Yes. Um, Agadish Prabhu is right in, in the sense that uh, Bhagavad Gita is Shruti. But for technical classification, because Bhagavad Gita is part of Mahabharata, and Mahabharata is considered Smriti. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita is also classified as uh, Smriti. Yes, yeah. a technical thing. <laughs> yes, right. Yes. And the, the, Ved the Vedantists, they only accept the Shruti. They say Smriti, imperfect knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Coming from people. But Vedas is Shruti. Aparusha, not coming from any ordinary person. Hmm. Hmm. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, any other 
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Maharaj, uh, what, what is the difference between Uddhava Gita and Bhagavad Gita? Well, <laughs> like the name says, Uddhava Gita, Krishna speaking to Uddhava, you could say it's the same knowledge. He's speaking about the modes of nature, how to get free of the modes of nature. But different situation, different circumstances. But the same message, the same points. You couldn't really say there's some any different purpose there. Uddhava, of course, has a special relationship with Krishna. And Krishna wants to share that knowledge with him, to give him that information. But I, I don't, I couldn't make a, any clear distinction that the Uddhava Gita is teaching something which is not in Bhagavad Gita. Thank you, thank you, Maharaj. We've got Gopi Gita also. You know, Gopi Gita is a different thing. <laughs> it's the Gopi Gita, the, the Gopis, they're, think, they're, think, they're speaking, they're singing their love for Krishna and their separation from Krishna. Hmm. So that's, of course, that's a very special Gita, the Gopi, Gopi Gita. They're feeling the love. The, they're describing their intense separation from Krishna and they're thinking about Krishna and how they think about Krishna. But Uddhava Gita, Krishna is speaking to Uddhava, right? So he's instructing Uddhava about the nature of the material world, material energy, how to transcend it. Yeah, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, any other questions? We, we have a, a, a chat from uh, Kirtana Marita Mataji. So she says, uh, please accept my humble obeisances, Guru Maharaj, all Raja Shantarupa. Thank you very much for your ever nectarian talk on the Bhagavad Gita. Um, still, no questions. I would just. Um, Prabhu, I have one more question. Sorry, Prabhu. Sorry. Guru Maharaj, one, one more question. Dwarak is here. Can he hear? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When we go for preaching, that uh, we also meet uh, outsiders. So when we preach about Krishna consciousness, they are telling to us, we are praying to Krishna. We are also offering to Krishna. We are also devotees of Krishna. But they are not coming into the temple and then uh, uh, scorn temples and do the services and everything. So what we tell them is, you, you are doing the services, praying Krishna, everything, without understanding the proper philosophies of Krishna uh, instruction. So you have to be committed to become a devotee of this. So is it a good way of telling them that you have to be get initiated, you have to be committed in order to involve in Krishna consciousness? If not means you'll be just doing a vague service. Well, Lord Krishna does say, in Bhagavad Gita, that you should have a spiritual master, right? That's yes. mentioned. You want to get spiritual knowledge, you're supposed to have a, a spiritual master. So, uh, they may not come to the temple, but they should have a spiritual guide. They should have a spiritual teacher, somebody who's guiding them and directing them and instructing them. You can't just simply worship Krishna directly. You have to go through devotees. You have to have a teacher. You have to. Krishna has a spiritual master. Krishna went to Sangipani Muni's ashram. Krishna went there. But so, like that, people not coming to Iskon. Okay, they may not come to the temple, but they should have a spiritual teacher who's guiding them, who's who's instructing them. There must be somebody there. They don't have any questions. They, they, they must have something. They must. What, what? How are they practicing? 
They say they are worshipping Krishna, but how do they worship Krishna? Do they know how to worship Krishna? They should, they should be clear about these things. Yeah. This is an example, Guru Maharaj, in, uh, in Penang, we have the Kunj Bihari temple in Penang Road. Uh -huh. they, also, they are also Krishna devotees. So, they are not coming into this kind of thing, taking, but they say they also have gurus. So, which sampradaya, we also don't know about it. So these are the differences we are facing from this kind of people. And they claim they are more superior. <laughs> yeah, they're in the bodily conception of life. They're, they're devotees, usually they're more in, by birth, they're thinking, devotee. You know, it's good. They're fortunate that they're born in a devotee family. That's very nice, a devotee from birth. But, you know, they're devotees to Krishna. They should know what is Krishna's teachings. They should, they, they, they say they have gurus? Yeah, they, they do have gurus. I don't know what kind of guru they have. It's not from his own gurus, outsiders. Yeah. Well, they may be coming. Even, they may come, even they have gurus also coming from India, also giving classes in the Kunj Vihari temple. Yeah. They, yeah, that is. Well, usually, you know, Prabhupada said, where, uh, some situation like that, <clears throat> when you scratch the surface, you go a little deeper, you'll see Mayavadi philosophy. That a lot of Mayavadi philosophy will be there. They're not actually, you know, although they may say devotee, and they're worshipping Krishna, but do they actually understand that we want to worship Krishna eternally. Usually the Mayavadi philosophy will be there. The people who come there and speak to them, they'll speak their Mayavadi philosophy. They won't speak the Vaishnava Siddhanta. Yeah. They're not... I, 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 do, I do tell them that, you know, in order to be committed, you have to chant 16 rounds of Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Then we can, you know, we can be very close to Krishna and everything. They say, no, not necessary. We are praying, we are doing all kinds of things. That is the understanding. The chanting process is not there. Well, they may be doing, like, there may be other mantras. They may be chanting some other mantra. They may be, are they reading Bhagavad Gita? They accept Bhagavad Gita? Yeah, they read, yeah. They, but different, not as it is, like Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, they have different Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, they have, they have not gone through with their Gita. Yeah, they have their own version, yeah. Their own version, yes. There are many Bhagavad Gita's, but they don't give the real message of the Bhagavad Gita. They're very difficult. Anyway, you know, you just simply have to encourage them. At least they have some connection to Krishna. Mm -hmm. Somehow, but they have no, no proper guidance, no proper, generally, you know, there are many people, they worship Krishna, but they don't understand, they think Krishna is the Brahman, for, coming from the Brahman, ultimately, all, all, so only the Brahman. We encourage people to chant the holy name, they, that's difficult for people. We encourage people regulative principles. That's usually, if they're Krishna devotees, then they should be vegetarian. That should be there, right? They follow the four, if they're vegetarian? Yes, they follow, but they have onion and garlic in their uh, meals. Oh, really? Yeah. So you can yeah, see kind of so onion that. and garlic. Yeah, yeah. So that's there. Yeah, they need more association, they need more guidance. Everybody, everywhere, there's a need of that. You see, it becomes a social thing. Going to temple, it becomes a, so, a social thing. So they have their community. So that's their temple, but it's like a, their community. And they speak their language, you know, they will speak their Gujarati or their Hindi, you know. Right. It, right. It's like that. And so. That's the problem, that you, it's, there's a lot of bodily conceptions still there. Although some religious practice is there, 
but it's mixed with the bodily concept of life. And that's very strong everywhere, even within our own temple. You know, we get people from the same community, speak the same language. It's, so it's, these are challenges in trying to br bring people to Krishna consciousness. You want to try to create the atmosphere to attract people, but people, you know, they will look at the faces and they will hear what language they're speaking. They think, oh no, no, I'm not from this community, this is not my community. And then they think, go some other place. So they're still in the bodily concept of life. Okay. This is a problem, to try to get people out of the bodily concept of life. So you have to try to, you try to make a group of people, you know, you get a group of people who are willing to hear and you try to have a regular class there. If they will allow you, you know. Yes, they encourage us to do the class there. Yeah. They encourage you to give class there? Yes, yeah. Yeah, you, should, coming. you should. You should have somebody, you know, like, you know, Ishan Goranga Prabhu is a very good speaker. You know, some people like that, you know, you've got some good speakers there. That you have, if you have a regular class, a regular kirtan, then you might get some devotees. But you have to, you have to give them the opportunity to hear regularly. You have to be willing to go there and preach regularly. It's not just one time. You want to have a regular program. People need to chant the holy name. You have to go there and teach them. You have to have kirtan with them. It's very important. You can't expect them to do it if you're not going to go there. You have some devotees have to go there and do it. Prabhupada went to America. He went there and did it. You want people to take up Krishna consciousness, you have to go there. Go to their temple. It's a Krishna temple. You go and you chant, have kirtan. And gradually people will join. They'll take interest. You have to help them to get a taste for the holy name. So it's possible. Yeah, they have a temple. They're not doing much. <laughs> So you go there and make some progress. Thanks, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Any questions? If there are no questions, then we will conclude today's class. Uh, I'll just wait for another 10 seconds. If there are other questions. We are all mindful that Guru Maharaj has a few other classes today. So Guru Maharaj looks like there are no other questions. For okay, all. thank you very much. Uh, thank thank all the much. devotees for their association. Hare Krishna, have a good day. Go back to Vrindaki. Jai. Jai.